So, I wanted to talk to you about the project that we're doing. It's called, um, on Wikipedia, it's called, uh, let's start with Jerry. And of course, you know Jerry Andrus is a very dear friend of yours and James Randi. And um, the project that you're, you're aware of, I just, um, is that um, we're trying to universally create Jerry Andrus pages throughout Wikipedia in every language. And we believe, have you heard of the phrase, um, seven degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon? Have you ever heard of that, where they, you know, they say, Jerry Andrus is like one degree away from everything that has to do with skepticism. So we believe that if we create Jerry Andrus' page, because also not only because he was a, a notable skeptic and because um, his, power, his um, creations still inspire people today, optical illusions are a great way of spreading skepticism. And it's a great way for us to translate videos from other languages because it doesn't need a lot of words. The optical illusion presents itself as it is. So I selected Jerry Andrews to start with. And after that's done, and we have people from many languages who are volunteering on the project, and we need a lot more volunteers, which is why I'm videotaping this today. Um, because once his, his uh, page is created, then they'll be trained, they'll be ready to kind of help out with the project and we can move from there to many other pages. Uri Geller, yours, James Randi, which is mostly done, um, spoon bending, cold reading, and we could just do the whole spectrum of um, everything from there. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that project and you know see if you thought it was a good idea. Well, to begin with, uh, you're aware, I assume, that there is a Jerry Andrews uh, uh, website. Right. Okay. I've used it many times. Yeah, and I haven't looked at it for a while. But for one time, they had a lot of good things. They had uh, videos. Yes, and, and, and they're now on his Wikipedia page. Okay, good. Um, okay, I think it's a great project, and Jerry's just the ideal person. Mm -hmm. he, he He's known all over the world. Right. Among magicians. But he's mm -hmm. also known for his optical illusions. Right. And he is the pure skeptic, you know, in the best yes. sense of the word. He always was. He began at age 12 being a skeptic. And this happened when he was coming home from school once. I, I, I was very much interested in finding out all that I could about Okay, him. we're going to get some good stuff now. Go yeah. ahead. So he was walking home from school one time. He was age 12. And his uh, high school had just um, lost a, a game to a competing high, middle school. Right? Right. Lost, a, lost a basketball game to a competing middle school. And he, among all the others, they were, uh, the students at his school were complaining that the judge, uh, the referees, uh, uh, you know, were dishonest and, and, and really? uh, made bad calls and stuff like that. The team didn't really lose. They, 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 oh, yeah. they, they lost because of that referee and how the others are. And as he was walking home, he doesn't know why, he thought to him, what if I were going to that other school? I would be saying, we beat those guys because they were inferior to us and we're a better school, you know, right. stuff like that. And he said, you know, and that got him thinking. From then on in, everything began thinking. You know, he, he was, his mother was a born-again Christian, very fundamentalist. His father, uh, I don't know too much about because his father died when he was uh, just about a little before he was 12. And, uh, but anyway, so, living in a, growing up in a lumberjack, redneck, town all over the world. Here's this guy, at 12 years old, suddenly becomes skeptical about everything. Religion, everything else. He goes to, began going through the Bible and finding contradictions and stuff can, like I that. I can totally picture this, too. Yeah. And he, uh, uh, so from then on in, he went on, you know, began thinking about all kinds of stuff. He thought the most important thing for the human mind is to be rational, to use it. And um, so uh, he, he by himself became you know, a, a total skeptic, a uh, magician who created, invented all his own magic. Right. Everything he did was so unique that he could fool magicians all the time. Mark Gardner once wrote that Jerry Andrews is the only magician who can consistently fool all the other magicians. Right. And um, Jerry, uh, I got him started in Africa. I take credit for that. Okay. Yeah, it was 1977 or something like that, late 1970s. I showed Jerry an illusion called the Mark Eden illusion. 
done with I did it with file cards. By the way, these file cards, Jerry used to cut them from me. Always did everything on file cards. Jerry, you imagine. But being Jerry, he didn't buy file cards. He cut big sheets of paper and cut them up himself. He does everything himself. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, keep these small. I don't have to buy them now. Because uh, for, uh, Miss Jerry would fool out of me. <laughs> but he used to keep these supplied. So, since we had these things, and Jerry was all around, uh, this is ideal for showing the Mark Eden illusion. Mark was a famous physicist at the turn of the century, about the 18th to 1900th century. And uh, uh, Eden was a contemporary in 1977, a psychologist at, at uh, MIT, and he, he, he discovered this illusion. The, the Mark illusion is you see a, a, a drawing of a book, or you see something like this. And it's a, it's a three a two D drawing, and people see the book is open this way. Right. But then if you stare at it, it'll, it'll flip around, and you see this is the spine sticking out. You know, oh right yes. Here. Yeah. Okay. So that's the. Oh my God. That's the that's the mark that's the mark that's the uh, the mark of it. But Eden added this thing to it, and he found that it takes a while with one eye if you stare at that. Eventually. Everything reverses. Right. This becomes uh, yes. the other one. Yes. And once it reverses, it gets a strange lighting effect. And once it's reversed, then you can move your hand like this, and it wiggles the opposite way from your hand. And then if you try to do this, and if you get still can hold it, and try to move it this way, it fights you because it's going the other way. So it's a great illusion. I showed it to Jerry, and he didn't seem to be interested, I, I thought. But two weeks later, he shows me. He says, you know, the problem with that illusion is how does it make So he created what he called a parabox. Uh, made a house. It's like with a house. the wooden... No, it's, oh, a, it's a oh, big yeah. house. Yeah, it's a house. Yeah. It looks like a house. If you look with at a it, wing you on say, it, so yeah. it makes it easy to reverse, because if you reverse it correctly, you see it as a little house. So he took uh, this illusion... Yeah, he, he went on there, he didn't, then he began to develop a variety of things based on that. And then suddenly he branched up, he ended up developing new illusions. Once he got going, he's about illusions all the time. And the most classic one, you know, his, uh, but I, I was the one who named it, the tri-zone space one. Okay, that, yes, that, that the spiral one. You know, with the three mm -hmm. zones. And uh, once he gets going on something like that, he just, almost every week, he was kind of up with me. Got all kinds of wonderful illusions. He was always thinking, yeah. any object you would hand him, he would be like, how can I make that? Yeah. Now, if you see this carpet here, if Jerry were here, he would show you that, how to stand and look with one eye and get all kinds of illusions out of it, just by standing like this, it's a better pattern here. He could show you, and you, you, if you could cross your eyes, and you'd see it, you'd find it, it looks like you're wallowing in the depths of these flowers and stuff like that. I remember many times we'd be standing in hotels, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a car of a hotel, you know, inside the hotel, and there'd be a carpet, something like this, and Jerry would have a group, of, two or three of us would get us to stand and look at that in the right way, and we'd suddenly see something. Then other people passing by, you know, coming out of the room, you'd see us standing, they didn't hold William, they were standing up there. Frisbee, a whole crowd looking down there, trying to see what's going on. <laughs> what are you looking at? What are you guys seeing? <laughs> You're looking for a little contact lens down there, or yeah. what? You know. Well, uh, so Jerry had a fun life in many ways. He did. But on top of that, Jerry wrote his music. And now, I didn't know this until we were cleaning out his house after he died. You know, right. But um, he wrote all his own music. He had a built his uh, this organ, which is a fantastic device right. tip of the jury. He kind of started with the Heath kit. They have these organs that you can get out to his mail, and Heath kit they call them, and you put together your own new organ. Uh, but he then began adding to it. He, he to find stuff. You know what a thermion is? No. It's a, uh, this guy Thermion uh, was a Hungarian or Czech, I'm not sure which, and he invented, um, oh, about maybe in the 30s or 40s, he invented this uh, musical instrument, which operates just from the heat from your hand, just from the, the heat rays. You just get your hand near it and you get different tunes. And Jerry built one, one of that, he added it to his uh, uh, organ. He had other things. He had electric uh, lights, coming, lights coming from the ceiling, which he could use to operate. So he put his elbow in front of this spot coming down here and uh, operate some other things. Was the thing here. And, and TV companies used to come like to want to, to uh, Show him doing, playing his music. He played only his own music, which he all wrote himself. Oh. Typical Jerry, and he could play this thing, and he get all kinds of effects. You're putting his elbow here and stuff like that, and it threw me on. And it was quite a show to see this thing too, because lights were going on and the whole thing. And 
He kept adding to it, and he had it in his front living room in his house, right. which is now, by the way, on the National Register. Oh, good. Yeah, I heard that. But anyways, so it was in the front room of the house. Pretty soon it got so big, it took over the front room, and he couldn't, he, the, the front door couldn't be used anymore. And that's where there was a mail slot where the mailman would leave the mail. And so that always continued. Mail kept coming there, but they couldn't get, no one could use that door. He had to come inside the door. Was nice. So when he had to get his mail, he would lie down flat on the floor. He could have to reach under several things and he could somehow be out of his mail. He couldn't always get all the mail. And I remember I got a phone call one time uh, from Stephen Mitch, who's a well known magician, but also now has his mind with publishes his, his own uh, press, which he publishes magic, but he publishes the Beach Green River Crop. But at that time, Stephen was working in a magic shop in Seattle. And he called me and he said, Ray, he says, could you get after Jerry Andrews for me? And we sent him a check three years ago. He still has a cash. <laughs> They bought some of one of these ringing green pins that he used to sell. And it was sitting and there? He was sitting there still. He just, you know, he, went, he never got everything when he went to it. Okay. <laughs> this is why we do Wikipedia, because I've never heard any of these stories, and I have been rewriting the Jerry Anders page for months now, and the Ray Hyman page. And this story doesn't exist anywhere, any of these stories. Yeah. And this is why we're doing Wikipedia, because through this video, We'll be able to cite this on their pages and everybody will be able to see this. And not only in English, we're going to do this in every language we possibly can. And I have a whole series of volunteers and I need more volunteers. Contact me at susangerbic.yahoo.com. No. Susangerbic at yahoo.com. And let's get this Jerry Andrews pages written. And then from Jerry, let's just move on and just take over the whole world and, and get some skepticism out there and globally. Okay? Okay, well, another thing. You, oh, you have to know, <laughs> this you have to know. If you don't okay. Know. You know, Jerry was noted for his uh, high morality. Yes. He was he did not like, told one lie. Yeah, yeah. I got that. I only told one lie. Okay, but you know the stories in the land of it. Okay, well. That he had not, he, he, no, he wouldn't want to give his opinion because it no. was. Oh, no. Oh, yes, yeah, that's true. That's, that's another he, thing. Oh, yes, but that would happen. <laughs> uh, you know, you've heard of Max Newton. Yes, I know. Okay. Well, Max came uh, one time to Portland. <laughs> to a, uh, he was doing a show in Portland. And right. he asked both Jerry and I to come out. I couldn't make it for some reason, but uh, Jerry came up from Albany and sat through his, not his show. Right. And uh, the way Jerry tells him, what he told me about it was that Max was using mostly cards, doing mind reading, but using cards. And Jerry thought that was too much. And it was, he wasn't too impressed. He thought Max could be better. And he was fearing, he said, he hoped Max wouldn't come and ask him. How he did, and sure enough, Max did come over to him. And um, I know the story because I, let me first tell you the other side of it. I told him about the same Steve Minch, okay? okay? So Steve Minch called me uh, from Seattle. And Max had gone from Portland, he was down to in Seattle. And, uh, and so he talked with uh, Steve. And Steve called me and said, Ray, what did Jerry do to upset Max so much? I said, Jerry, we never do anything that upset anyone. Right. He said, but, well, uh, he said, uh, Max said that he went up to Jerry and I said, Jerry, asked his opinion, what do you think of my show? And uh, Jerry said, after thinking for a while, he said, Jerry said, well, Max, you have a nice voice. <laughs> that was honest. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is pure Jerry. And he wouldn't lie, but he told one lie. I, I found that story. Oh, okay. If you remember that? The only lie he ever told? He was in the army? Oh, yes, he did. Uh, he did because he didn't want to take advantage. They told him about the eye chart. No, it was a, what letter is not on the phone Front, dial? That's it, you're right. And, right. He, and when the people came that's out, right. they were doing yeah. an intelligent that's, test. That's right. And when the guy came out of the uh, room, they, they said, what'd they ask you? What'd they ask you? He says, well, they said that there's a letter missing off the the dial of the phone, and they said, well, what is it? And he says, it's a letter Q. So Jerry had the answer. So when he went in, in he yeah, when he went in, they said, do you know what letter is missing off of the phone dial? And he said, no, sir, I don't. Even though he knew the answer, right. he lied because he didn't want to. It, that's right, because it was, it was comparing to one morality against another. Yes, and, that, and that's Jerry. Okay, your arm is probably dead. <laughs> well, i got to tell you the one